What's going on everybody, it's ETA Prime back here again. RetroArch is officially available over on the iOS App Store. It works with the iPhone, iPad, and even the Apple TV. I've been messing around with it quite a bit on the iPhone and iPad, and I figured I'd go ahead and make a full tutorial. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to set up RetroArch on your iOS device, be it an iPad or your iPhone. I'm gonna try to make this as easy as possible on new people coming over to RetroArch, and we're gonna cover quite a few things here from getting the application set up, games imported. I'm also going to show you how to set up a controller. We'll mess around with a few different configurations. I'll also show you how to change the look and feel of RetroArch, but by the end of this video you'll be able to emulate thousands and thousands of different retro games on your iPhone or your iPad. And if you're wondering what systems are supported by RetroArch right now on iOS, uh, if you head over to the App Store page, they do give you a list. So we've got Amstrad, Atari 2600, 5200, 7800, Lynx, Wonderswan, PC Engine, Super Graphics, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, NES, SNES, uh, PSP, Virtual Boy. Going down the list, there's a ton available right now. We've even got some PlayStation 1, so yeah, there's probably something in here that you want to play. And before we get into it, one thing that I highly recommend is heading over to the Libretro Docs. This is kind of a getting started section. This will tell you everything you need to know about RetroArch from BIOS files, ROM files, and we're going to go over a lot of that. Basically, with this video here, I'm going to make it super easy so you can be up and running in no time with RetroArch on your iOS device. So if you're ready to get started, let's go ahead and jump into it. I've just moved over to my iPad to make it a bit easier to see everything and recently posted a video showing you how to get PSP games up and running with the newly released PPSSPP on the App Store. If you want to check that out, link is in the description. But obviously today we're going to be covering RetroArch. And again, I didn't want to make this overwhelming. We're going to go over all of the basics. You'll be up and running playing some games very shortly. But the first thing we need to do here is obviously download RetroArch. So if we're on the App Store, you can search for it, or I'll leave a link in the description. We'll go ahead and get this installed. Now that we've got it installed, I recommend before we do anything, we're going to go ahead and launch this one time. There are a few things we need to do here. As you can see, it's going to extract the assets by itself. Whenever I start up RetroArch for the first time on any device, I always go to the online updater. From here, there's actually quite a few things that we can update. Now, since this is relatively newer to the App Store, a lot of this stuff might be updated, but it's good practice to go ahead and do this. We're going to update the core info files, assets, controller profiles. You can update the cheats, database, also go through the overlays, and slang shaders. Not totally necessary, but something I always like to do. And just to give you a quick rundown on how to navigate RetroArch on the iPad or iPhone, you can use the touchscreen. It's actually got really good touchscreen support. Over on the right hand side, we've got our navigation panel. So, home, we've also got our playlist and our settings, little cogwheel over there. Lots of stuff that we can do here in settings, but again, I don't want to overwhelm anybody. We're going to cover the basics. We're going to get some games imported. I'll show you where everything goes. We can also download some artwork, we can change the menu. First things first, I wanted to talk about the video driver here. Now with RetroArch on iOS, we've actually got a few to choose from. So over on the right hand side, we're going to go to our settings, scroll down until we see drivers, video, and this is going to be where we choose our video driver. Out of the box, mine was set to Vulkan. We've also got OpenGL and Metal. So Metal is specific to iOS devices, and with some things it does work much better, a little faster. But for the most part, I've been using the Vulkan backend with a lot of this stuff. If you get up to the higher end emulators and they don't perform well, you can try swapping over to OpenGL or even Metal. But again, I'm going to leave it right here. Just wanted to give you a look. But now that we've got RetroArch installed and we've done a little bit of updating here from the online updater, it's time to get some games transferred to our iOS device. And again, I highly recommend learning how to use the files application. So on my iPad, You'll see I've got a RetroArch folder here. And inside of this directory, we've got a lot of folders, but there's only a few that we need to worry about to get games up and running. System is where our BIOSes are going to be located. This is where we need to drag and drop everything. We're going to be covering PS1 in this video, so we will need a PlayStation 1 BIOS. And just to make everything much easier, we're actually going to place our games inside of the RetroArch folder here. But now we need to get some games transferred over. 
There's several ways you can go about this. You could download them directly on your device. You could transfer them from a Mac or a PC. You could upload them to your iCloud drive and then download them directly from the Files app using, obviously, iCloud drive. Or you could use external storage, and that's really an easy way to get everything transferred over. So that's exactly what I'm going to be doing here. But for each one of the emulators we can use inside of RetroArch, there is a specific file format that those games need to be in. And in order to find this out, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you can head over to the RetroArch docs. I'll leave a link in the description. Or we can actually find out directly from within RetroArch. We're going to launch the application. And at the very top, we're going to load a core. A core is basically the emulator we're going to be using. And these platforms are pretty self-explanatory. You will see multiple of the same item because there are different cores that we can use. But for instance, let's say we wanted to add some GBA games. Let's move down till we find an emulator that supports GBA. So right here. Now we can choose information, core information, and this is going to give us what we need to know. So if we scroll down a bit, you can see that supported extensions right here, GBA or .bin. We'll go back and check one more out here. Load core. And now we're actually going to check out PlayStation 1 because this is a system that does usually require a BIOS. Let's use the PC SX rearmed version. Information. Core information. If we scroll down a bit. Supported extensions. This has a ton that we can choose from. Bin, Q, .img, MDF, PBP, DOC. Even ISOs will work. And again, I did mention that this usually requires a BIOS. You can see that we're missing those BIOSes. So our SCPH5500.bin, that's the PS1 Japanese BIOS. SCPH5501.bin, that's the US BIOS, and so on and so on. Once you have the correct BIOSes, obviously it's not going to be missing anymore. So it's just really easy to kind of find out what file extension we need per game and if that emulator needs a BIOS to run. Moving back to our files application. Personally, I like using external storage just to transfer everything over. I've just plugged in my Kingston USB Type-C drive. And in this folder, you can see I've also got a folder named ROMs. These were transferred from my PC. Inside of that ROMs folder, I've also separated all of my games by system. GBA, Mega Drive, PlayStation 1, or PSX. Mega Drive, I've left all of these zipped, but these are some that we can import into RetroArch very easily. PSX, which is my PlayStation 1 folder. I personally use PBP files, but as we saw, PC SX Rearm can utilize a ton of different file formats. I'm going with PBP. And finally, my Game Boy Advance section. These are all .gba files. I've also got the PlayStation 1 BIOSes that I need to transfer over. So now let's go ahead and get this on our internal storage. I'm going to reselect my external drive. We're going to select our ROMs folder, and I'm going to move this full folder over to my internal storage. So I'm just going to copy it. Back to on my iPad, RetroArch, RetroArch. Scroll all the way down to the bottom till we've got a little blank spot, and we're going to paste that ROMs folder right in here. Long press. We'll paste it over. That way, everything's nice and neat, it's all together, and we can easily access it from within RetroArch. So we've got all of our ROMs in the correct location, but remember, we've also got that PS1 BIOS, or the PS1 BIOSes. We're going to copy these, so we're just going to select all of them, and we need to move these to the RetroArch system folder. So we'll move RetroArch, all the way down at the bottom here, System. This is where our BIOSes go for RetroArch. So now we've got our games that we can import and we've got that PlayStation 1 BIOS right here. Now that we've got some games on our device, let's start RetroArch back up. And there's a couple ways to load a game. You can easily just load content and navigate to that directory. But I'm going to show you a way to make everything nice and streamlined. From our right hand menu, we're going to go to the three lines or the hamburger menu. We're going to import content. We want to scan directory. So documents, RetroArch. Inside of here is where we placed our ROMs folder. And we can scan this full directory. It's actually going to scan through each one of these folders for us. PlayStation 1, Mega Drive, GBA. Scan this directory. 
and you'll see it found 24 games. That's all I transferred over for this tutorial. It's finished scanning. Back to our playlist section, all the way down at the bottom, you can see we've got a Nintendo Game Boy Advance section, Sega Mega Drive, otherwise known as Genesis, and Sony PlayStation. If we go into each one of these, you'll see that it automatically downloaded artwork for us. My naming convention is correct for these games. Sega Mega Drive. Might take a little while to get these downloaded, but we can force download. There you go. Some of them are coming in right now. And it may have missed one. Sonic and Knuckles, possibly. And finally, Sony PlayStation. So it's an easy way to go ahead and get our games imported, and now we can access them right on the fly. From our playlist, Mega Drive. If you want to start playing, we can do it right now. So we're going to go with uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Run, and now we need to choose a core to run this game with. And the core is basically the emulator we're going to be using to play this game. Personally, I like Genesis Plus GX, this middle one here. But you can definitely experiment if you want to. I'm going to go with Genesis Plus GX. Run. And now we're playing Sega Genesis on our iPad or our iPhone. So we've got these on-screen touch controls. You can definitely use these if you want to, but I'm going to show you how to set up a controller also. It's actually really simple to do. Down at the very bottom, we've got a little RetroArch icon. Tapping this will bring us right back into RetroArch. We can resume from the quick menu. Go right back. Close content. That's just going to shut it down for us. And now we can start something else. So we'll go to GBA. Run. Again, since this is the first time we're starting up a GBA game, we will have to choose our associated core. Experiment. See what you like. Personally, I go with the VBA Next Core. Run. Now we're playing Game Boy Advance. Back up. We'll close this one. And the final thing we're going to take a look at is PlayStation 1. Sony PlayStation. We'll go with Bloody Roar. Run. And I've already associated a core with PlayStation 1 just to make sure everything worked correctly. I'm using PCSX Rearmed. Just like all of the other emulators, you can pick and choose. It's actually really simple to get this set up, and I know the interface itself, without any context, does look a bit complicated. And trust me, you can go much deeper with RetroArch, but just to get you up and running for the first time on your iPad or your iPhone, it's actually pretty simple. Another thing some people might want is an on-screen FPS counter, just to know that you're running those games at full speed, and it's very easy to activate inside of RetroArch. We're going to go to Settings, User Interface, On-Screen Notifications, Notification Visibility, Display Frame Rate. As soon as we tap that, we've got our frame counter up in the top right-hand corner. This is going to stay there until we disable it. It will be there while we're playing games. This just kind of gives you a good idea if that game is lagging or not. Next thing I wanted to talk about here were controllers. And uh, getting a controller paired up to your iOS device is pretty simple. RetroArch does support a wide variety of controllers, and if you've got like an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller, all you need to do, make sure in pairing mode, pair it up with your iPad, and once we move back in, that controller is going to be working. Now, of course, you can remap these buttons if you need to, but there's one thing I wanted to show you here, and that's a menu toggle hotkey. I'm going to get into a little bit of gameplay here. And once we boot this up for the first time, we've connected this controller. We've still got those on-screen buttons, which can be a bit annoying. You can always minimize them from here. And remember, we've got that little retro arch button, which will bring us right back into the menu. Out of the box, our controller isn't going to be able to do this. So if we disabled those on-screen touch points, but luckily we can map this to our controller. So we'll head back into retro arch, settings, input, hotkeys, and we'll see a section here, menu toggle. This is specifically for our controller. And there are several different configurations that you can use. I'm going to go with Start and Select. So we'll choose this one. And once we get back into gameplay, this is now our menu toggle hotkey. So while we're playing a game, if I can get back in here, we'll just press Start and Select at the same time. It'll bring us back into RetroArch. Now, of course, on-screen controls are still here, but let's go ahead and disable those. 
Settings, User Interface, On-Screen Overlay, and we can disable it from the top. Now, once we get into gameplay, all of those on-screen buttons are gone. We don't have to worry about them getting in the way. We've got a full screen experience with RetroArch on these Apple devices. And the final thing I wanted to show you was how to change the overall look and feel of RetroArch. Now there's a lot that'll go into this here. I might want to swap these colors out a little bit. From settings, user interface, appearance, color theme. So we're using the ozone dark right now, but we've got several to choose from. You can just go through, find which one suits you. It's up to you. I'm going to keep it at ozone dark just because once you get in there, it's going to look like this. The menu system we're using right now in RetroArch is known as the GLUI, but there's others that we can choose from. Settings, scroll down to drivers. The very top option here is menu. If we go in here, you can see they've got one known as Ozone. Personally, I think this is more tailored towards controllers. Uh, the touchscreen does work really well with this GLUI. RGUI is gonna be the really old school RetroArch. And finally, XMB. We will have to do a restart, so we're going to go ahead and close this down. Open it back up. Now you can see we're using the XMB theme. While this does work with touch pretty well, I personally recommend using a controller. But this is really nice. It's just a good interface. As you can see, once we get to our recently played or our history, it'll give us that big box art. But all the way over at the other end, we've got our systems that we've imported. And this will go all the way, depends on how many systems you have imported. Get some really nice box art here, and I think it looks really good. So it's really up to you what kind of uh, menu system you'd like to use with RetroArch, but having a physical controller is really going to help out with these better looking menus. So yeah, there you have it, RetroArch on iOS devices. It's actually a pretty simple process to set up. I know we kind of went over a lot of stuff and there's way more that you can go over with RetroArch. I mean, you can dive very, very deep into the software, but I kind of wanted to make this simple enough so anybody could follow it and get up and running with their favorite retro games. But that's gonna wrap it up for this video. I really appreciate you watching. Links for everything I mentioned are down below and definitely check out those Libretro docs. There's a lot of great information over there if you get stuck on something. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comments. And like always, thanks for watching.